Hey folks, now that you've had a nice relaxing whole two weeks off, let's jump into your first Chemistry OneNotes video of this year. Today we'll be covering nuclear reactions and half-life in your first lesson of Unit 5. This covers standard C.2.6 and C.2.7, which ask you to be able to describe nuclear reactions and to perform half-life calculations. So, let's get started. The big idea behind nuclear reactions are that they involve, drum roll please, that's right, the nucleus. This is different than when atoms bond together in chemical reactions, as those involve only the valence electrons. Nuclear reactions involve all sorts of other particles, including the two you already know exist in the nucleus, the proton and the neutron. Before we get started, let's refresh your memory. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons. We'll call it Z here. The mass number is equal to the number of protons and neutrons. We'll call it A. And when you have two atoms with the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons, we call them isotopes of each other. We can denote an isotope in two ways. We can write the element symbol, with the atomic number as a subscript and the mass number as a superscript, both on the left side of the symbol, or we can write out the element's name, followed by the mass number of that isotope. For example, we could write carbon-14 like this, or like this. You also already know that electrons are held around a positively charged nucleus by their electrostatic forces of attraction. In other words, the positive protons and the negative electrons attract each other. You also know that like charges repel each other. If that's the case, then why are our positively charged protons allowed to exist so closely together within the nucleus? Well, that's due to something called the strong nuclear force. This is the strongest of our four fundamental forces of nature, which you might learn about in Chem 2. This is the attractive force that acts between protons, between neutrons, or between protons and neutrons, and holds them together. It's significantly stronger than the electrostatic repulsion of the positively charged protons, but it only works in very extremely close distances. We're not going to go too deep into it, but there's a certain amount of energy either gained or lost when the particles inside of the nucleus bind together. And that nuclear binding energy is what's responsible for the stability of atoms and their ability to undergo nuclear reactions. So before we go much further, let's talk about the different particles that will be involved in our nuclear reactions. Obviously, we have our protons and our neutrons, which we know make up the nucleus. Protons can be represented by these symbols. This tells us that we have one proton and the mass number is one. It's basically the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, but without its electron. Then we have these symbol for neutrons, which tell us that they have the same mass as a proton, but they have an atomic number of zero, because there are no protons. Now we're going to get into some particles that I like to call the Greek particles, because they're all named after the Greek letters of the alphabet. The first letter of the Greek alphabet is alpha. An alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons. This is the nucleus of a helium atom. So we often just use helium's chemical symbol to denote it. We can also use the Greek letter alpha. The only differences between an alpha particle and a helium atom are that the alpha particle is very high energy and doesn't have any electrons attached to it. A beta particle is simply an electron. More specifically, it's a high-energy electron. We denote it with either the Greek letter beta or an E for electron. It has a mass of zero and a charge of negative one. A positron is a positively charged beta particle. Just like in an electron, it has a mass of zero, but it's positively charged. Last but not least is the gamma ray. Gamma rays are just very high-energy photons or light particles. Like any other type of electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, visible light, x-rays, etc., these photons travel in waves. 
Gamma rays have extremely short wavelengths and therefore very high energy. Well, now that we know the particles involved, let's talk about the four types of radioactive decay. Anytime an unstable nucleus, which we call a parent nucleus, loses some particles to become a more stable daughter nucleus, we call it radioactive decay. The four types of radioactive decay are named for the particles we just talked about. In alpha decay, a nucleus will lose an alpha particle, again two protons and two neutrons. This will cause the atomic number of the daughter nucleus to be two less than that of the parent nucleus, and the mass number will be four less. An example of alpha decay is polonium-210 decaying into lead-206. You can see this in this animation here. Next up, we have beta minus decay, which we usually just call beta decay. This is when a neutron releases some of its inner particles and turns into a proton. The particles released by the neutron basically result in a high energy electron being emitted from the nucleus. Since one of our neutrons is turning into a proton, the mass number stays the same, because neutrons and protons both weigh one, but the atomic number is going to increase by one because we just gained a proton. In beta plus decay, or positron emission, which we more often call it, a proton will release its positron and turn into a neutron. It's kind of like the opposite of beta minus decay. Instead of a neutron turning into a proton, this time you have a proton turning into a neutron. Just like beta minus decay, it doesn't change the mass number but it does change the atomic number. In this case, the atomic number will decrease by one because we just lost a proton because it turned into a neutron. Finally, we have gamma decay. This is when a nucleus that has a lot of energy will release some of that energy in the form of photons or gamma rays. There is no change to the atomic number or the mass number, but the nucleus does become more stable. When we're trying to show that radioactive decay is happening, it's not very easy to draw it all out or make an animation like the one I showed you for alpha decay. This is why we learned the symbols for the different particles before. We simply write equations such as these to show what's happening. So for example, if polonium-210 underwent alpha decay, it would release an alpha particle and turn into lead-206. We can show this using either the Greek letter alpha or the symbol for helium as we talked about before. Notice the changes in the atomic number and the mass numbers. Basically, the numbers on the right side of the equation should add up to give you what's on the left. This works for beta minus decay, even though the electron has a negative 1 for its atomic number, beta plus decay, and gamma decay as well. Since gamma particles don't affect the atomic number or mass number, we have to show the change in energy between the parent and daughter nuclei. In order to do that, since the parent nucleus has extra energy, we put a little asterisk next to it to show that it has extra energy. The common way to discuss how fast a radioactive isotope will undergo decay is by referencing its half-life. Now I'm not talking about the video game. The half-life of an isotope is the time it takes for half of the atoms in a sample to decay. Half-life data is important because it gives us an idea of how long we can continue to use an isotope before it's no longer effective, like in nuclear medicine, or how long we have to safely store a dangerous isotope before it's okay to put it back into nature, like in nuclear power plants. To give you an idea about how half-life works, let's take plutonium-243 as an example. Plutonium-243 has a half-life of five hours. If I start with eight grams of it, after five hours, I'll only have four grams left. Then five hours after that, I'll only have two grams left. And then five hours after that, I'll only have one gram left. This keeps going like that until you get to the very last particle. So let's do some examples of the math of half-life on the board. All right, so our first practice problem says that we have a 100 gram sample of actinium-226. Now actinium-226 is a half-life of 29 hours. So if we leave that sample set out for 58 hours and it decays, how many grams are we going to have left over? There's a couple ways you can do this. 
For your purposes in Chem 1, I'll always do whole number ratios of, of how many half-life cycles we go through. So in this case, we have uh, 58 hours as our time. If we divide that by our half-life, which is 29 hours, we get 2. That means it went through a half-life decay two times. So if we take the 100 grams, we divide it by 2, there's 50 grams. Then we divide it by 2 again, and it's 25 grams. That's one way to do it. You could also take this equation. Now what this says is the um, amount at a specific point in time, your original amount is in 0, uh, time, and half-life. We get the same answer. Basically, you take your 100 grams times by one-half to the power of whatever your time was, so 58 divided by 29, which is our half-life, and that would give us 100 grams times one-half. 58 divided by 29 is 2, so one-half squared, which is one-fourth, which would get us 25 grams. Either way you do it's fine with me as long as you get to the right answer. Okay, our second problem says we have an 18 gram sample of radium-226. It has a half-life of 1,600 years. How long will it take for it to decay down to 2.25 grams? There is an equation we can use with this, but it involves a natural log and it's a whole process. So we're going to do it the slightly longer, but a little easier to think of way. You'll want to think of what fraction 2.25 is of 18. So take 2.25 and divide by your 18. So take your um, amount that you have at the end of that time, divided by your initial amount. We get that, and it comes out to be uh, 1 8. So then the next question is, how many times do we have to take 1 half times itself to get 1 8? Well, 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth, times another 1 half is 1 8. So it took us one, two, three half-life cycles in order to decay down from 18 to 2.25. So if it takes three half-life cycles, and each half-life is 1,600 years, just take your 1,600 years by three. And you get that it would take 4,800 years to decay down to that amount. Example of problem three is a pretty similar one to two. Now this time you have 160 grams of polonium, 212, and it decays down to 10 grams with a half-life of 0.16 seconds. How long does that take? So you do the same kind of thing. Take your 10 divided by 160, and that gets you 1 16th. And then you figure out how many times you have to take 1 half times itself uh, to get 1 16th. Another way to think about it, instead of multiplying 1 half by 1 half one by 1 half, just take an exponent. If you do 1 half squared, that gets you 1 fourth. 1 half cubed is 1 eighth. 1 half to the fourth is 1 sixteenth. So that means it took us four half-life cycles. So if our half-life is 0 0.16 seconds, multiply that by 4 and you get 0 0.64 seconds. Okay, now that we got decay out of the way, Let's talk about our other two types of nuclear reactions, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. The names are really similar, but they couldn't be more different. Nuclear fission is when a large, unstable nucleus breaks up into two or more medium-sized stable nuclei. This generally only happens when you bombard or shoot the nucleus with some neutrons. Fission releases a tremendous amount of energy. For example, if one kilogram of uranium-235 were to completely undergo nuclear fission, it would release 2.5 million times as much energy as burning one kilogram of coal. That's why nuclear power plants are so incredibly efficient in comparison to coal-fueled plants. You might remember the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II from your history class. Those atomic bombs, and other nuclear bombs like it today, involve mass chain reactions of nuclear fission. This illustration of nuclear fission shows what might happen a little better. 
Sangue took a uranium-235 atom and shot it with a neutron. That extra neutron makes the atom unstable, and it breaks apart into atoms of krypton-92 and barium-141, releasing massive amounts of energy and a few neutrons along the way. Then we have nuclear fusion. When two very light nuclei combine to make a larger nucleus, we call it nuclear fusion. It's basically the opposite of nuclear fission. Instead of one thing breaking apart into two, we have two atoms coming together to form one. We usually see this in isotopes of hydrogen, like deuterium and tritium, fusing together to make helium. This releases even more massive amounts of energy than fission does. In fact, this process is what gives the sun all of its power. We've tried to make fusion reactors here on Earth, but so far have been largely unsuccessful as the plasma that's formed has so much energy we don't have any material on Earth that can contain it. Here's an animation of what happens when a deuterium atom and a tritium atom combine. Notice the two nuclei fuse together, creating a new nucleus with two protons and two neutrons. This leaves an extra neutron to be released out into the wild. Well, that's all for today, folks. I hope you took the time to write your notes down and we'll watch this video enough times to understand the material. As always, if you have any questions, please ask.